Now, reassembly is basically disassembly in reverse. Since the lower adjusting ring was the last part removed, then it's also the first part to be reinstalled. The mechanic starts by lubricating the internal threads. He uses a brush to ensure an even coat of lubricant and to work the lubricant into the threads. He then positions the ring so that its threads engage the threads on the outside surface of the seat. He carefully screws the ring down around the seat, turning it until the upper rim of the ring is just about flush with the upper rim of the seat. To set the ring in its original position, he uses the lapping block as a reference point, just as he did during disassembly. He first cleans the surface of the lapping block with a clean rag. Then he lays it flat on the seat, adjusting the ring as necessary to ensure full contact between the lapping block and the seating surface. Next, he checks his notes. His notes tell him that he must turn the lower ring 10 notches below the level of the lapping block. Knowing this, he inserts a screwdriver through the hole for the lower adjusting ring pane and turns the ring counterclockwise until it touches the block. This gives him his starting point for turning the ring clockwise 10 full notches. Before doing anything else, he must lock the lower ring in position with a locking pin. He lubricates the threads on the pin. Then, he turns the pin into the casing as far as it will go. A wrench helps to tighten the pin into the notches on the ring. Now, he removes the lapping block and checks the lower ring to be certain that the pin is holding it in position. The upper adjusting ring is installed next. As with the other threaded parts of the valve, the threads on the upper ring are thoroughly lubricated to prevent binding or corrosion. Then, the ring is installed in the valve body. Notice that he first turns the ring counterclockwise. This helps him to mate the threads on the ring with the threads in the valve body. Once the threads engage, he turns the ring clockwise so that it threads downward into place. Of course, turning the ring like this only places it in approximately its original position. To be certain the ring is positioned exactly, the same measurement that was taken during disassembly must be repeated now. The mechanic checks his notes. For the upper ring to be in its original position, its rim must be exactly five-eighths of an inch below the lip of the valve body. To repeat this earlier measurement, he places one rule across the lip of the valve body and places a second rule vertically so that its end lies flat against the top of the ring. His first measurement tells him that the ring is too close to the top of the valve body, so he turns the ring clockwise to lower it. He then repeats the measurement. Obviously, the ring is still too close to the top of the valve body. As you can see, positioning the upper ring is largely a matter of trial and error, but no matter how many tries it takes, don't settle for a near miss. Installing the ring in its original position is essential for reliable operation of the valve. Bullseye, five-eighths of an inch exactly. To keep the upper ring in place, he installs the upper adjusting ring pin. As the lower pin, he first lubricates the threads Then, he inserts the pin as far as it will go into the valve body. A 
and uses a wrench to tighten the pin into the notches on the ring. As a final check, he tries turning the ring to be certain it's locked in place. The spindle and the feather are assembled next. As we mentioned earlier, the tip of the spindle is designed to allow it a certain amount of side-to-side -side motion when inserted in the feather to minimize friction between the tip and the inside surface of the feather, lubrication is essential. And once the spindle is screwed into the feather, it should be wiggled back and forth to make sure the movement is smooth and easy. Before the feather and spindle are installed, contact between the feather and the seat must be checked. This is done by applying a thin layer of Prussian blue to the seating surface of the feather. The bluing should be applied evenly around the entire seating surface. Any excess must be wiped off before the test is made. The feather is then inserted into the valve so that it seats properly. To prevent damage to the spindle, only minimum downward pressure should be exerted. When the feather is removed, this is what you should see a thin, uniform ring of blue around the lip of the seat. It indicates that the feather and seat match perfectly and there is no chance of leakage between them. If you see a pattern like one of these, where the ring of blue is interrupted, even if the interruption is as small as indicated here, you'll know that the feather and seat do not fit together correctly. Additional lapping of the feather, the seat, or both is required. In this case, though, the mechanic finds that the feather and the seat match perfectly, so he can go on with the reassembly procedure. First, of course, he cleans the Prussian blue off the feather and the seat. This ensures metal-to-metal -metal contact between the two parts. He then carefully sets the feather and the spindle into position. Next comes lubrication of the studs that secure the yoke to the valve body. When these lubrication steps are completed, the yoke is set in position on the valve body. Extreme care should be used so as not to damage the spindle or the studs by banging the yoke against them. The nuts are then put on the studs and tightened with a wrench. Remember to tighten the nuts in an opposition pattern, that is, Tighten one nut, then the one directly opposite it, then the third nut, and the one opposite it. This ensures even contact between the valve body and the yoke. The yoke is now secured in position. This brings us to another critical point of the reassembly procedure, installing the compression screw. The threads of the compression screw are thoroughly lubricated. But before the screw is installed, the mechanic checks his notes. His notes tell him exactly how many turns are required to put the screw back in its original position. In this case, 21 and a half turns. He slips the compression screw over the end of the spindle and into position at the top of the yoke. He carefully lines up the yoke and the spindle so that the screw fits properly. Then he turns the screw until he feels the screw threads engage the threads of the yoke. This gives him a starting point for beginning his count. The witness marks he made earlier help him to keep track of the number of turns. Each time the witness marks pass each other, he counts one turn. He continues counting even when he can no longer turn the screw by hand and must use a wrench. To be certain the screw is in exactly the right position, he uses the divider that he set earlier. If the tips of the divider fit precisely into the witness marks, he knows that the compression screw is where it should be. He then tightens the compression screw lock nut against the yoke. 
The lock nut prevents the screw from moving during normal valve operation. Notice that when tightening the lock nut, he uses a second wrench to hold the compression screw in place. He doesn't want the screw to move even a partial turn. When the lock nut is secure, he reassembles the hand lifting assembly and installs the protective cap. He first lubricates the threads at the top of the spindle. He turns the lifting nut into place. Then he installs and tightens the lock nut. Next come the protective cap, the hand lifting lever, and the pivot pin that holds the hand lifting lever in place and enables it to move up and down. Before securing the pivot pin or protective cap in position, he checks the amount of play between the lever and the lifting nut. By inserting a taper gauge between the lever and the nut, he measures the distance between the parts. The gauge tells him that he has about a sixteenth of an inch between the lever and the lifting nut. This is well within the manufacturer's specifications. So he tightens the set screw that holds the protective cap in place on the yoke and installs the cotter pin that holds the pivot pin in position. All that remains now is to attach the lock wire to the adjusting ring locking pins. The wire is first threaded through the hole in the head of the lower pin. Then the wire is twisted together to form a single strand. Next, one free end of the wire is fed through the hole in the upper pin. Again, the ends are twisted together to form a single strand. To lock the wire in place and to serve as a signal that the rings are properly set for operation, the metal clip on the end of the wire is secured around the wire close to the lower pin. Squeezing the clip with pliers locks it in place. 